This program is brought to you by Emory University. Wow, that's loud. I never use these microphones, but um, Dr. Great made me do this so that you can watch this again afterwards. You don't have to. <laughs> if you must, you can do that. Anyway, so um, I'm going to give a little bit of a broad talk today about the research we do about parasites, um, evolution of parasites, and then as part of that, really talk about how the monarch butterflies that we use as a model system can use milkweeds as medicine, so really as medicinal plants to fight off their parasites. But it's going to be a little bit broader than that. And um, so, you know, if you have any questions, just throw them out. This is a nice small group. We can keep it very informal. If there's anything you want to hear more about or something isn't clear, just shout out, all right? So what I want to do is look at four questions in this uh, presentation. And the first is really asking the question about parasite virulence. So when we think about using plants as medicine, right, we use them because parasites are parasites. We define parasites as organisms that do damage to their hosts, and that can be us. They can cause disease. And, you know, what, it's actually a really interesting evolutionary question to find out why they do that. What is in it for parasites? What is the evolutionary significance of virulence? How can it be selected for and be maintained in natural populations? And that's really the, questions, the, the question that drew me to the system at first. I want to talk about that because that will also make the rest of the talk fit in that, that bigger question more. And then I'm going to talk about the milkweeds. So monarchs use milkweeds as their, as their host plants, their caterpillar host plants, and we will find there's a lot of variation in the chemical chemicals in the plants that are associated with medicinal effects for the monarchs, so reducing parasite activity and so on. And we're going to look here if monarchs can actually use that and use the milkweeds as a form of medicine, just like humans do, use herbal medicine, can monarch butterflies do that too. And then from there I'm going to talk a little bit about evolutionary consequences, if we get to it, it doesn't matter if we don't, really give you an idea of the kind of research that we're doing at the moment to really expand this work that we have been doing into understanding how these medicinal plants really affect the virulence evolution of the parasites as well as the medication behavior evolution of the monarch butterflies. And time allowing, I'll talk a little bit about the different populations of monarchs around the world, which is not, you know, it's, it's related to these other questions, but it's also a little bit loosely uh, related, so we'll see if we get there. <clears throat> so to start off, monarch butterflies, very famous. This is um, some footage taken at Mexican overwintering sites. So the monarch butterflies migrate to Mexico every year. And that's because they rely on these milkweeds and they die back seasonally here in North America. And so the monarchs from Canada and the United States travel down to Mexico every year. And they go there in the millions. And some years we have had hundreds of millions of monarchs coming together in these patches of forest in Mexico, central Mexico, about three hours west of Mexico City. And you really see butterflies upon butterflies. It's a very strong phenomenon, very famous butterfly for doing this. Now, the reason we are interested in monarchs is partly the migration. That's actually much more recent. I started studying monarchs because they get sick. And they get sick with a really interesting parasite. And you can see that here on this video. So what I'm looking at here is basically prints. You can put a sticker on the abdomen of a butterfly and then pull off some of the scales. You see these big blobs here are the scales of the butterflies. And all the little black specks are the parasites. So they form spores on the outside of the butterfly. And these monarchs carry millions of them. And they really are quite detrimental, as we will see later. And this is really the reason I started studying these monarch butterflies. So here's a close-up of the parasite. 40 micrometers long. It looks a little bit like a deflated football. And um, actually quite big. 40 micrometers is long enough so we can manipulate them individually in the lab. We can pick up a spore and infect a caterpillar with a single spore, which is really important for the kind of work that we do. And again here, the migratory monarchs sitting on top of each other. And then this is the, the monarch caterpillar, and it's on the milkweed. So milkweeds, there's multiple species that monarchs can use, about 30 species they can use, um, but most of them are in the genus of Asclepias. And um, can anyone guess where that name comes from? Maybe you've covered that in this class? Or you have done your classics? No? No guesses? Ever heard of the Greek god Asclepius? But what, what was that god famous for? Remember? It was the Greek god of healing, right? So it is actually interesting. The name Asclepius already tells you that these plants are medicinal. 
right? And it also comes to show that a good science education requires some understanding of the classics. Because you don't have to know anything about these plants to know there must be some medicinal properties by just looking at the name. So that's pretty cool. I didn't know that either, by the way. I learned that a few years ago, so don't worry. Then again, I didn't go to a liberal arts college. <laughs> I went to a Dutch university where all I learned was biology. Okay, so monarchs, I talked talk, um, talk to you about the migration here in North America. So that is our migrating monarchs. They go from Canada, North America, <laughs> down to Mexico. I made that a long time ago. This was really difficult. You know, this was, this was pushing the limits of PowerPoint at the time. <laughs> So that's why I still use it. It's taking me a long time. So <laughs> they don't migrate as far. So these are the monarchs actually west of the Rocky Mountains. There's monarchs. They overwinter along the California coast. But then across the world, and these are supposed not to move, that's not a PowerPoint mistake, <laughs> they're resident populations, right? So they don't move. They actually, monarchs have colonized the world. So they're in South Florida, say in Costa Rica. We see them in Ecuador, Hawaii, New Zealand, Australia and also on um, the Canary Islands, and these days also in Spain, Portugal, and Morocco, so they've really colonized the whole of the world. And what is significant about that is not only that they vary in their migration, but also in the milkweeds that they use. And you can see different pictures. These are the dominant milkweeds that monarchs use in these different populations. And what that means is that these monarchs are exposed to different species of milkweed. That also means that their parasites are exposed to different types of medicinal properties in these populations, which is why we're interested in this and why we want to look at all these populations around the world. So getting at that first question, to really set the scene here, is asking the question, why do parasites harm and kill their hosts? And this is really asking, why are parasites parasites? Because we define parasites as organisms that do harm to their hosts, right? They're parasitic, they extract resources from their host, they don't give anything in return, the host really suffers. But we have to understand why that is. And this is a really good picture to illustrate this. So this is a monarch butterfly. This is not your typical picture that you would see in National Geographic. Right? This is a very sick monarch. And this monarch is so infected with parasites that the parasite has poked holes in the abdomen and the monarch is basically oozing bodily fluids. It's stuck to the chrysalis casing, and so it cannot get out. And this is interesting, because that means that monarch is not going to fly and not going to live, not going to mate, not going to lay eggs. And actually, as we'll see, that is really detrimental to the parasite itself, because the parasite needs the monarch to get to the stage of egg laying, which is when it gets transmitted. Um, this is not a parasite that is a predatory wasp that's basically taking advantage of the whole situation, cutting up the monarch and taking it to her nest mates. So why do parasites harm and kill their hosts? Now, if you go to a medical conference, and some of you may want to do that in the future, what you're going to find out is that a lot of people will tell you, well, parasites are only virulent one, you know, soon after they jump a species barrier. So you get a disease, say Ebola, say HIV, that jumps the species barrier that comes from some wild reservoir species, jumps to humans, and is very, very virulent. It kills a lot of people, does a lot of disease. And people will tell you, well, that's because it hasn't had time yet to become benign and to become nice to the host. And the intuitive idea is that these parasites need their hosts to survive, so they're going to be nice to them, right? And I always think that's a little bit akin to saying, well, we as humans depend on our earth, so we're nice to it. Okay. So you can debunk that straight away. But the point here is you can look at all these parasites in, in wild animals and in humans that have been around for millions upon millions of years that still do a lot of damage. And a lot of these parasites are not novel parasites to their host. So what this means is there are parasites out there that have been with their host for a long time that are still virulent. And that means that there is natural selection favoring parasites that cause virulence. And we need to understand why that is. So the leading hypothesis that's been around for about 30 years now is that parasite fitness really is based on a trade-off between virulence and transmission. From the parasite's point of view, how do you increase fitness? It's by transmitting to new hosts. So if I'm infected with something, which I may not be right now, which is good for the people on the front row, but if I was, you know, the parasites in me increase their fitness by spreading to one of you and hopefully to all of you, right? And that would be the perfect parasite. In order to do that, 
right? For that to happen, the parasite needs to reach a certain level, a certain population size within the host. And so what we're assuming in this model is a positive relationship between parasite exploitation, that can be the number, say, of virus particles, it can be the growth rate of a protozoan, some measure of parasite exploitation, and when that goes up, transmission stage production goes up too. And with that, transmission rate, so the chance of infecting novel hosts will go up. The problem from the parasite's point of view is that a parasite cannot do that without incurring some costs. And those costs are incurred by extracting resources or doing damage to the host. And by doing that, the parasite will also increase the chance of killing the host. So mortality rate also goes up. And so what you get to is a situation where, from the evolutionary point of view, the parasites that transmitted the highest rate would be selected for. But they're selected against because they can kill the host before they can transmit. And so the resulting fitness curve is an optimal curve where at an intermediate level of parasite exploitation you get the highest fitness. And if natural selection favors such parasites, it favors parasites that cause some level of mortality. Right? That level is not zero. So now we can explain how parasites could be selected for to cause virulence by selecting for lifetime transmission opportunities. Because that is what causes, what creates fitness for these parasites. So that's the leading model. And um, so what I wanted to do was really test this in a, in a real system. So this model has been around for a long time. Very few people have tested it. So when I started working on the Monarch system, this is what I wanted to test at first. And so Monarchs have a, have a nice life cycle. They lay eggs. Caterpillars come from the eggs. They eat up the egg shell. Then they eat up the milkweed surrounding the egg. And they go into what we call the prepupal J. Then they undergo pupation. Now we get real metamorphosis happening. And then after about nine days, from here to there in the lab, we get a new butterfly emerging. When we look at the parasites, the parasite life cycle is here. So imagine this is a monarch butterfly infected with parasites, and let's say she's a female, then she will carry millions of these parasites on her abdomen. And then when she lays eggs, she will transfer some of these parasites to her eggs. And this is a passive process. I mean, she cannot stop it. Uh, the parasites are dormant. They don't actually do anything on the outside of the butterfly. So they just sit there and then they get rubbed off onto the eggs and onto the milkweed. And the caterpillars eat them up. And the caterpillars eat up the spores. The spores break open in the midgut. And then you get sporozoites coming out. They go through the hypodermal tissues and they start replicating asexually first and then sexually during the pupal stages. And then what we get, we can infect a caterpillar in the lab with a single parasite. The resulting monarch will carry million, millions of these spores. So very rapid replication. And that allows us to ask that question when we go back to that graph that we just looked at. You know, can we see what the relationship is between the number of spores on the monarch butterfly and the transmission rate, as well as the virulence that is caused by that number of parasites in the monarch butterfly? It's a very good system to look at this trade-off hypothesis. So this is just another view on the life cycle. And uh, you see very small caterpillars at first. They grow very rapidly, actually, in about 12 days from egg to, uh, to pupa in the lab. This is, very, this, this is when they're really big and when they start preparing. This is the late pupal stage and the new monarch comes out. I always have to think, it would be really amazing to be the first person to see this life cycle. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, we learned this, right, in elementary school when we read The Very Hungry Caterpillar. Mm -hmm. Who has read The Very Hungry Caterpillar? Okay, tell me two mistakes made in that book. How recently did you read? You may not remember. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Caterpillars don't eat ice cream or sausage or um, salami or, you know, they don't eat strawberries and plums and apples and pears. They're usually specialists, right? So that's very important. Caterpillars are generally specialists. Most of them are. Um, moths often are not. They um, eat multiple trees. They still wouldn't eat ice creams. Well, what's the other thing? So you get metamorphosis. What do the caterpillars form to become an adult? According to Eric Carle, they make a cocoon, right? So wrong. <laughs> <laughs> they make a chrysalis. Okay, so if you take anything away from this lecture today, <laughs> next time you go to kindergarten, you say, well, that book is all wrong. Because a cocoon is made out of this spun of silk. Moths do that, but you know, the, the butterflies don't do that. It's actually their skin. They shed their skin. So they don't make a cocoon. It's a chrysalis. A cocoon is easier to spell in a children's book, I guess. But it's very wrong. 
All right, so some of the experiments we did, really looking at the relationship between the spore loads that we can measure on the monarchs and in the transmission and virulence. And so this one experiment we did, we had monarchs in individual cages, you can see one there, and then we put milkweeds in there, and what we do over the lifetime of the monarch is measure the number of eggs they laid, and then measure the number of parasites that are on each and every egg of them, and then also measure the number of parasites that are deposited on those milkweed plants over time. And so here's some examples. Here is a monarch with a, an, an egg with a spore there. Here is a very extreme case, an egg with more than a thousand spores. That actually doesn't happen very often. This is more, more common. And so then we can look at what the parasite does. And I already showed you this. So we find this when there's very many parasites on the monarch, the monarch will get stuck. And this happens more so when there's more parasites. So I'm going to show you a lot of graphs on this slide that, that start, that have the x-axis, the log 10 spore load, so from about 100,000 to several million. And here on the y-axis I have emergence probability. And so it goes from 1, where 100% of monarchs emerge fine, to 50% where only half of them get out of their chrysalis cases properly. And you can see increasing numbers of spores really reduces the emergence probability of the monarchs. Now the other thing we found is that mating ability also gets, um, goes down. So these are actually two monarchs mating, and this is, if you ever want to find a mating pair, you look for them stuck together, the males basically force mating upon the females, and this can go on for 30 hours. That's the longest we have measured in the lab. Usually at least two hours, um, but extreme cases, more than 30 hours, these monarchs can stick together. And the males basically take the females around wherever they go. Yeah, it's very romantic. Um, <laughs> so here we have mating probability, again, from 100% from going down. And so this is partly, this reduction in mating ability is partly when you look at the lifespan of the monarchs, here on the y-axis, again as a function of spore load, you can see this clump of monarchs here, those monarchs don't live long enough to actually mate, so that really reduces their mating ability. But beyond that, the monarchs that do survive long enough to become sexually mature also are not as active or attractive, we don't really know yet. But, but the fact is, this really goes down. And this is important, right? So we have two aspects here that are really important fitness reductions for the monarch, but also when you think about it, it's bad for the parasite, right? Again, that parasite gets transmitted during egg laying, so these monarchs won't even mate, and these will also not mate, and so they're not going to lay eggs, and the parasite is basically dead. So that means there must be really big benefits of high spore loads from the parasite's point of view. And of course, we can find those in transmission. This is transmission probability. And that is basically the probability that some parasites are transmitted during an egg-laying event. And we can see again, when parasite spore load goes up, that probability really increases. So higher numbers of spores, more chance that the parasite will make it onto the eggs. Right? Very intuitive, but it's there. And then you can look at the number of spores that are deposited on eggs, and the number of spores that are deposited on leaves, and we can see positive relationships with spore load as well. And that is important because from other research we had already shown that when there is more parasites on an egg or on a leaf, the chance of infecting the caterpillar that eats that eggshell or that eats that leaf will go up as well. So what you can do then is you have the, the negatives, right? So these are the costs for, for the parasite of high parasite growth. We have the benefits. You can put them together and see at what level is parasite fitness maximized. And we do that using statistical methods, basically of all these regression lines, we multiply them, and what we get is these optimal curves. And so just as in theory, we can see that highest fitness is reached at an intermediate level of parasite exploitation, which in this case is measured as parasite spore load. And so when we think about it, on the left of this curve, we have very happy butterflies that emerge well, they mate well, but every time they lay an egg, they don't transmit many parasites. On the other side, we have very heavily, monarch, heavily infected monarchs. Very few of them make it out of the chrysalis and very few of them mate, but when they do, they transmit many parasites. Whereas in the middle, you have monarchs that are sort of happy and sort of heavily infected, and so they live long enough to mate, but also live long enough to transmit parasites at a good rate, and this really increases the transmission of the parasite over the lifetime and so parasite fitness is maximized at that point. Now when you take this back and then say, okay, well, let's look at that level of spore load that maximizes fitness, you know, at that level we would predict a 10% reduction in emergence probability of the monarchs and about a 15% reduction in mating probability. In other words, if natural selection favors these parasites that have highest fitness, 
it favors parasites that reduce the um, emergence probability and mating probability of the monarch. So now we can understand that there is virulence. Any questions about this? No? Yes? Um, do all the scores split? You know, is that, is that a good indicator of how many parasites there will be? Or is that an indicator of just like more versus less? Do all the spores live? You mean on the outside of the butterfly, or when so they get like ingested? You're finding spores of the parasites. Not all the parasites will be infecting the spore butterfly, or is it just you know they all? They are the ones that are basically the outcome of the infection. So you look, you take a butterfly, and the way we do it, we have, once it's dead, we remove the abdomen, shake it you know, on a vortex mixer for five minutes in water, shakes off the parasites. We can count them, so we know how many parasites there were on the outside of the butterfly. And so that is what that measure is. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. How, um, is there any cases of butterflies who are like either immune or like do not transmit or like parasites? Great question. So there are differences in how immune the monarchs are. So some of the monarchs we have looked at are much harder to infect than others. So you give them the same dose of say ten parasite spores and they just don't get as inf it's 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 um, they're less likely to become infected. When they do become infected, they don't experience the same growth of parasites. And um, those differences you find within populations of monarchs, but also between. So, for example, if you go to Hawaii, you find monarchs that are much more resistant to the parasite than when you go here, you know, to Georgia and catch the monarchs here. So there's there's big differences. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Um, are the males and females able to see like? if um, the person they're going to mate with is infected and they choose not to mate with them? It's a really good question. So, <coughs> but that is exactly one of the things we want to look into. We know that the monarchs don't mate as well when they're infected, but we don't know if that's because their partner notices that they're infected and, and don't choose them, them to mate with. So one of the ways we want to look at that is basically have males that are uninfected and then give them a choice between an infected and an uninfected female and see what, what, what they do. And it's actually interesting because the infected females will be less active and thereby less resistant to the mating attempts of the male. So then if you find an avoidance of them, it's really strong avoidance of the males. So we don't know that at the moment, but something we want to do. Good questions. Excellent. So let's move on to the plants then. Let's start looking at these things. So here is again a little caterpillar. These are the flowers of the, the milkweeds. I'm really asking the questions, how do these milkweeds affect virulence? And so this is really interesting because in my field where people look at hosts and parasites, most people will look at them in isolation. I mean, you take the host, you take the parasite, in lab experiments you bring them together. But the thing is, in the, in the wild, of course, they don't act in isolation. What we're seeing now is that when you really start thinking about these hosts and parasites in their community ecology, in their tritrophic interaction, what you find is that a lot of organisms are really affected by the plants that they use, and that a lot of organisms can use plants as medicine. And so we actually put this together two years ago, where you see a lot of insect, or not just insects, but animal systems. Of course, this was all very well known in, in primates, non-human primates, especially chimpanzees, where um, animals can use particular leaves as a form of self-medication. But now we also see it in woolly bear caterpillars, fruit flies, wood ants, and monarch butterflies, as I will show. And I think it's really important to recognize this. And so what we were trying to argue in this, this paper, and what we're trying to do with our research is really show that this sort of self-medication can be very important, can have really strong effects on parasite virulence and transmission, and thereby have major consequences for things such as epidemiology, which a lot of us are interested in, virulence evolution, host parasite local adaptation, the evolution of immunity, when you think about if you can use medicine instead of immunity, maybe there's trade-offs between those things, but also drug discovery, you know, and, and you'll all learn a lot about it in this course, of course, how we can use botanical medicine and herbal medicine and natural plants and, um, you know, the knowledge of local people to find out about these medicines. And I would push that a little bit further and say we can look at these animals that have tiny little brains, you know, and actually see what they do and what they have been doing for millions of years as potential new discoveries of drugs. Now, in the marks, again, what I've talked about so far is the host-parasite interaction. 
And so what is important, as I already said earlier, of course, is the milkweeds that the monarchs use. So this is not a simple two-way interaction. This interaction cannot occur without the food flowers. This is really what the, the monarch caterpillars need. The adults can use nectar from multiple different species, different families of plants, but the caterpillars are very specialized on milkweeds. And so it's well possible that these milkweeds have an effect on the health, the general vigor of the caterpillars, but they may also have direct effects on the parasites. And if that's the case, then you can imagine that these caterpillars or the adults can actually determine what species of milkweeds are going to be used and thereby indirectly affect their own interactions with their parasites. So we started this with a very simple experiment. These are two species of milkweed that we grew in the, milk, in, in the greenhouse. Asclepius incarnata, which is swamp milkweed, and Asclepius curasafica, which is tropical milkweed. And you can see these species look quite similar. They actually smell very different. So if you put a blindfold on and go into our greenhouse, then you can actually tell them apart. These ones smell just much more interesting than those. These basically don't smell of anything. And these smell, you know, very herbal, medicinal, very good. If I was a sick monarch, I would use them, basically. <laughs> So I figure I, I can do it, right? Monarchs can do it too. So what we did is we reared monarchs on these two species, and then we would look at the effects of the species on the uninfected monarchs, as well as on monarchs that we infected with parasites. So here I'm going to show you the longevity, the lifespan of adult monarchs, first for uninfected monarchs. And you see there's no difference depending on the species that they use. So whether they're on Curisavica in yellow, or incarnata on orange, you see there is no difference in the lifespan of the adult butterflies. Now, an adult lifespan is the simplest thing we measure in the lab that correlates with the other virulence measures that I showed you earlier. And then we infected them with one of four parasite clones, and now we can see a big difference. And the first thing we see is that the infected monarchs don't live as long as the uninfected monarchs. We already knew that. But the big difference here is that when the monarchs are reared on Chorus Savica and the yellow bars, they live much longer than when they were reared on the orange bars, on the incarnata plants. Right? So big difference. So these plants have an effect. The curasafica has an effect on the infected monarchs, but not on the uninfected monarchs in this experiment. So where is this coming from? Now when we look at the means of the parasite clones, so we have four groups infected with different parasites. Here are the monarchs that were reared on curasafica plants. So four groups based on four different parasite genotypes. They had relatively low parasite spore load, and thereby live longer. <coughs> versus the monarchs reared on the incarnata plants. Right? On the other plants, they had higher spore loads, and thereby they lived a lot shorter. And so this is a very strong relationship. So we can understand that the monarchs did better when infected, when reared on the Curisavica plants, because the parasites didn't produce as many spores, and thereby the monarchs lived longer. So why is that? So can anyone tell me what this monarch is doing? It's not feeding. Actually, it is feeding. What is it doing with these wings? Sort of a philosophical question. Yes. If you see that monarch, what, what, what do you immediately think? Nothing? <laughs> Pollinating? Pollinate? Did someone say that? Maybe. Monarchs, butterflies in general, are not actually very good pollinators, compared to bees at least. So what stands out when you look at the monarch? Color. Spots. Color. It's pretty. Right? So what particular colors does it have? And have you seen that, you know, the before? Does, there, does it ring a bell? Yeah? Orange. yeah, it's orange. It's black. It's white. <laughs> <laughs> They're warning colors. A lot of um, venomous or toxic animals actually have display colors that are very bright. So when you look at the animal kingdom and you find bright colors, there's basically two reasons. What's the other reason for an animal to be bright? Mating, right? So courtship, sexual selection. So when you see a very colorful animal, you say, well, either this is a very attractive, usually male. This is actually male. You can tell it's got a spot there. But in the case of monarchs, they're actually advertising. There's actually no sexual dimorphism in this species. Females also have the same colors. And so this is actually warning coloration. And so what a lot of animals do, they have these innate warning colorations that predators associate, especially when they taste a monarch and then learn not to touch a monarch again. Now, monarchs are toxic 
because they take chemicals from their milkweeds, and they're shown here, they're called cardenolites or cardioglycosides. And the milkweeds have, of course, evolved these as a deterrent of herbivory over time, which means that most herbivores cannot use milkweeds. And if we eat milkweeds, unless in the right dose, we may die. But we can use them in the right dose, it makes them medicinal, hence the name. And the monarchs take these chemicals, so the monarchs are not just resistant to the chemicals, they take the chemicals out of the plants and defend themselves against their predators. So it's a brilliant example of hijacking the defenses that the plants have evolved and using them for your own benefit. And there's other milkweed specialists that do the same, such as queen butterflies, and then there is uh, bugs, and there's aphids that have all evolved this ability to do that. And by doing that, so these are experiments done by Lincoln Brower in the 1960s, what he would do is rear these monarchs on different species of milkweed that vary in the concentrations of these chemicals, then feed them to blue jays, then see how long it takes for the blue jay to throw up. And what he finds is that the blue jay throws up more quickly when the monarch fed on a species of milkweed that has higher concentrations of the chemicals. And that blue jay feels so bad that it's never going to eat a monarch again. Right? So it's a very good association. You taste something, it's extremely bitter, it tastes terrible, and then you associate it with those warning colorations. Now what's happened in ecology um, is actually that, you know, for the longest time, if, if you have taken ecology, you'll, you'll notice, is that everything in ecology was explained on the basis of competition, and then for several decades people said, hey, predators are really important, so everything can be explained in terms of predators, and it's only about 30 years ago that people started realizing, hey, parasites may play a role too. And now, of course, I would argue that everything is explained by parasites mm -hmm. to some extent. And um, so when we started looking at this, right, we thought, well, these chemicals, they're probably not just used against predators. They may also be involved in the action against the parasites. So we teamed up with Mark Hunter at the University of Michigan, who's a chemical ecologist, to measure these chemicals in the plants that we are using. And what you can see here, the Curacelica plants that reduce the success of the parasite have much higher concentrations than the Incarnata plants of these chemicals. And it's not just the overall concentration, it's also the diversity of these chemicals in the milkweeds. So here is a histogram that shows the degree of polarity, that's the retention time on the HPLC. So you can run your chemical samples on the HPLC and the order in which they come off tells you something about how polar they are. They go much faster when they're more polar because they move faster. And when they're very non-polar, it takes a long time to run off. This is incarnate plants. You can see that 100% of the plants in this particular peripolar cardenolite, 20% had a second cardenolite, so not much diversity in those plants. You look at the Curacelica plants, there's a very wide diversity, right? So not only do they have higher overall concentration, they contain a lot more different compounds. And a lot of them, and that's important, a lot of them are very non-polar, and we think those are the biologically active ones, because they can get through cell membranes much more easily. So if they had a direct effect on the parasite, they could get there more easily. <coughs> so since then, we have looked at this across more species. There was just two species to start with. This is an experiment with 12 species. This was done by graduate student Eleanor and then three undergraduate students in the lab. And every point here is a different species of milkweed. And what we plot is spore load and the lifespan of monarchs again. And what we can see is that some of the species, the parasites don't do very well, thereby the monarchs live long. And in other species, the parasites grow very fast and the monarchs don't do very well. And what you can see here is a brilliant example of scientific serendipity, right? I started with Curacelica and Incarnata, and they're on different ends of the spectrum. Just imagine if I had done my first experiments with those two plants, I may not be here today, right? Because I'd said there is no effect of milkweeds. And it's actually important, right? Because oftentimes people look at scientists and think, oh, they knew what they were going to do five years ago. Absolutely not. Right, a lot of it is just running into particular, you have an idea, you do it, and you go in a completely novel direction that you had never expected. And that was certainly the case, you know, by find, starting my experience with those two and really getting those big differences, I could really start this whole new line of research to look at the effects of milkweeds on, their, on, on the parasites of monarchs. Now, when we look at the cardenolite concentrations, again, so here's total cardenolite concentration in these 12 species. This is the lifespan of infected monarchs, and what we can see there is by and large a positive relationship, meaning that higher concentrations of cardenolites result in benefits to the monarchs. The infected monarchs live longer. 
However, there is this species here, Asclepius physocarpa, that drags the whole relationship down, and this suggests that there is a level of cardenolites that is actually detrimental to the monarch, right? It's like taking a medicine that works well against the parasites, but also has really bad side effects. That is how we're thinking about this. And we just got data back. So these data I just got this morning, so this is a very um, actual talk, right? Very good. Very recent findings in here. And it's actually very nice because we did another experiment um, where we looked at seven species of milkweed, really trying to fill in, really add some species that have very high levels of these cardenolites to see what we can find. And now what this is showing, this is actually plant cardenolite non-polarity. So it's a measure of the polarity of the whole composition of the cardenolites in these milkweeds. And then here is spore load on the y-axis. What we can see is when the cardenolites become more non-polar, the spore load goes down. And that's what we would have predicted, again, because we think that non-polar cardenolites are biologically more active. So when there's more of those, the spore load goes down. That should be good for the monarch, right? Because fewer parasites means less virulence, the monarchs live longer, they're happier. However, what you see, sorry. that's my wife trying to phone me from Kenya. I'll get back to her. <laughs> anyway. So, so this, is, this, this is good, right? That's a benefit from the monarch's point of view. But what we can also see is that the lifespan of uninfected monarchs also goes down with increasing plant cardenolite non-polarity. So this is actually our first demonstration really to show that you know, there's benefits and costs to these compositions of the cardenolites in the milkweed. And so then what you try to do is put this together, and that's what we do here. So now we can look at the lifespan of infected butterflies and we get this optimal curve where an intermediate level of plant non-polarity is actually beneficial. That is the one that maximizes the fitness of infected monarchs when they're infected with this parasite. Right? So this is actually really interesting to me because it shows indeed that you have these medicinal milkweeds, the chemicals are, are associated with these medicinal properties, but there's also costs to having these cardenolites. And this is really an example of the right dosage, right? So there is some level of dosage that is actually best for the monarch's health um, when they're infected. Any questions on this? No? All right. So <clears throat> one of the things that, you know, the problem with all these experiments this is basically correlational, right? So we have our plants, we can measure the cardenolites, we can see how the monarchs are doing, but we haven't actually ever manipulated the chemicals yet. And so we did another experiment that is shown here, and this will actually demonstrate... These plants... Oh, stop, I hate how you're on myself. I can't, I can't show you that. <laughs> so I was just going to show that when you rip off a leaf, there, come, there is late. I can actually just show that. I can shut this, this sound down. You have this thing when you're recorded. It's not nice to hear yourself. <laughs> oh, that's very really long. Do it again. These plants contain toxic chemicals no, called cardenolite that, that probably works. evolved in these plants to fend off that's herbivores. Like now, the interesting thing about monarchs is that they have specialized in these plants and they don't get affected by these toxic chemicals. As a lot of, you know, these chemicals compounds, uh, secondary compounds in it, but no nutritional properties. So what we can do is basically take that latex from one plant and put it on another plant, and by doing that, what we know is that we're just transferring secondary compounds. We're not transferring any nutrition, and that really means that we could turn a non-medicinal plant into a medicinal plant just by transferring that latex. And that's what we have done. Two undergraduate students have done that in the lab, and what we do is we take an incarnata leaf disc, and this is what we put the parasites on and then feed it to a caterpillar and that's how they get infected. And then what we do, we either add the latex from the incarnata plant, so this was the non-medicinal plant, we had latex from the curosavica plant, which is the medicinal one, or we had latex from the physocarpa plant, which was the one that drew that, that dragged that relationship down, right, where we thought this really has too high cardenolite concentrations to be beneficial to the monarch. And what we find, this is the adult lifespan of the monarchs, we see this stepwise increase, right? So 
the more medicinal the latex was, the more we increased the lifespan of the monarchs. And this is quite interesting to me because the only thing we do is just during this stage where the monarch is exposed to the parasite, that is the only time they're exposed to the latex from the other species. Right? And even that small amount of time gives it enough to actually benefit from it. And this really reduces the success of the parasite. Now you may think, well, in the other... I wouldn't have expected this, right? Because the Physocarpa plant was the one that actually drew down lifespan again. But I think the difference here is that in that other experiment we did, the monarchs were reared their entire life of this plant. Here they only get a little bit of latex during this stage, and so then it's actually beneficial. So it comes back to the idea of the drugs being useful in the right dose. Too much is not good, but the right amount at the right stage. This is the right stage where we think the parasites are directly affected by the chemicals. That is when the monarchs really benefit. So from there, we said we have these differences in these milkweeds. Monarchs really benefit from some species over others. So is there any chance that monarchs could use this to their own benefit? You know what, in other words, if a monarch caterpillar was infected, could it preferentially eat the Curacavica plant that is antiparasitic over the non-parasitic Asclepias incarnata plant? So that's the first hypothesis. The second hypothesis is that it's not actually the caterpillars that do it, but it's their mothers that do. Because it's the mothers, really, that choose the plants for their offspring. The caterpillars come out of the egg and eat the plant on which they were laid. They don't really have much choice in this species of butterfly. So the second hypothesis is actually the females. They're so good at overpositing and having choices that they, when they're infected, prefer to lay on the medicinal plant as opposed to the non-medicinal plant. So we did several experiments. In the first, what we did, and this is important, we actually reared the caterpillars on a third species, Asclepius tuberosa, because we didn't want the monarchs to get used to one species and then just use it because they know it. We really want to give them a novel choice between plants they haven't seen before. And then we give them a choice between Curacavica and Incarnata. And this is little larvae here. You see piles of milkweed here, bigger stacks of milkweed here. This was done by uh, Cherry, the postdoc, and Lindsay, a undergraduate student in the lab, and really trying to understand how much of the milkweeds do they eat through their lifetime. And what we find for the caterpillars is absolutely uninteresting. So we have infected monarchs on the left, uninfected on the right, and every dot here is an individual caterpillar. And then on the y-axis we have the proportion of the total diet that consisted of the medicinal plant, the Asclepius curacavica. And we can see it's 50-50. So the infected monarchs derive 50% of their diet from one plant, 50% from the other. The uninfected monarchs, it's the same, so they have no preference. They just eat what they encounter. They don't have a choice. So then we went on to look at the adult butterflies. And the way we do that, we set up two plants in a big cage, and then we put a monarch in there for an hour or two hours, depending on the experiment. And we simply count the number of eggs. You saw an egg laid there. We count the number of eggs laid on each plant after that time period. Right? It's a very simple choice test where we can see if the monarchs have a preference. And we set this up, this is our greenhouse. So we have these big five, five of these big cages, plant in the front, plant in the back, and then we randomize where the plants are. And then this is what we find, this is much more interesting. So this is the proportion of eggs laid on the Asclepius carosavica, the medicinal plant, by infected monarchs in black, and uninfected in white. And what we can see is the infected monarchs have a strong preference to lay their eggs on the medicinal curacavica plants. In terms of odds ratios, they're twice as likely to lay any one egg on the medicinal plant versus the non-medicinal plant, where the uninfected monarchs have absolutely no preference. Now this is interesting, because what this suggests to us is that these monarchs can medicate their future offspring, but not themselves. So these monarchs, if she's infected, she already has all these parasite spores on her abdomen. She cannot get rid of them. She cannot medicate herself. We already saw that the caterpillars cannot medicate themselves. But what this data tells us is that these monarchs, when they're adults, can preferentially lay their eggs on plants that will make their future offspring that are going to be infected by the parasite that she transmits, without wanting to, of course. But those caterpillars will then be less susceptible to the parasite. Right? So this was really the first time that had been shown that this sort of medication can actually work from mother to offspring as opposed to individuals doing it themselves. 
Any questions on this so far? Yes, please. Um, so if caterpillars don't have any preference to the milkweeds, like based on the medicine, if they're medicinal or not, mm -hmm. medicinal, how do adults, like, I guess, acquire that knowledge of which plant is medicinal versus which one? Yeah, it's a good question. So I don't think they have any knowledge of which one is medicinal or not. I think it is an innate preference. And um, so, <clears throat> so think about it. When you're sick, your preferences for food change immediately, right? Some, some smells that you normally really like are really revolting, and some things that you normally wouldn't like, you think, oh, that actually smells quite good. It's the same with, with pregnancy in women. You know, some, they really have big aversions to certain foods. So I think what's going on in these monarchs is that their infection changes the physiology such that their innate preferences change. So they're infected, they're really suffering from this disease, they're feeling bad, and they just respond to these chemical cues of these plants differently. And as I said earlier, these two plants that we use are distinguishable by us. You can blindfold me and I can go in the greenhouse and tell you which ones they are. So my <coughs> hypothesis is that these monarchs, you know, their physiology changes, their preferences change, and they just get more drawn towards the plants that are more medicinal. They don't have to know anything. They can't learn it either, right? This is purely innate. And it's actually a really interesting question because it used to be thought that, you know, the reason everyone focused on things like chimpanzees and elephants and dogs and, you know, big brain mammals was these animals can learn. They can learn from each other. They can learn from experiences. And that's where you're going to find medication behaviors. But now it's clear that you can get it in animals that do not do that sort of learning. So monarch butterflies are one. Fruit flies are another. Woolly bear caterpillars, ants, bees, they can all do it without having this <coughs> prior knowledge. Yeah, very good. Other questions? All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of the things we're doing right now, which is really building on this work and taking this further, really trying to understand evolution in different populations of these monarchs. We have until quarter to four, is that right? Yeah, okay. So this is really what we're focusing on now, really the consequences of such medication for virulence evolution. That's going back to the first topic, something I was really drawn into, uh, into the system for, and also local adaptation. Now, this is actually a really interesting question that people have thought about and really trying to understand what can be the effects of medication on virulence evolution. And this is really theory that was based on imperfect vaccines. Now, imperfect vaccines are vaccines that reduce infection but do not prevent it. Now, a lot of our vaccines that work, that we have all had when we were children, are what we call perfect vaccines. They really protect us from being infected. A lot of the vaccines that are developed right now, such as for HIV or malaria, are not going to be that strong. They're not going to be as good as all the vaccines that already exist. And so what they're going to do is they're going to reduce parasite burdens. They're not going to prevent infection. Now, theory has shown that this could actually select for more virulent parasites as follows. So here we have a fitness curve, much like the ones I've shown you before. This is parasite fitness as a function of parasite exploitation. And let's say we have six different parasite genotypes here. Then we can see that epsilon 3 and 4 here actually have very favorable fitness, very high fitness. They're the ones selected for. But now what you do is you implement an imperfect vaccine. And what you do, you basically shift the curve. Because what you do effectively is reduce the growth of all the parasites. So now the ones that had higher growth rates to start with now reach the highest levels because their intrinsic rates are now brought down to the level that maximizes their fitness. And so you're selecting for those. Those are the ones selected for now. And um, now this theory was really developed in the context of vaccines, but this of course applies to other things such as drugs as well as medicinal plants. And so we have done theory to follow this up. This was with Samuel Alison in Montpellier. And uh, what we did here I was really trying to understand if you increase these medicinal effects of the milkweeds, do you also select for more virulent parasites? So what we have here, this is a fitness curve as a function of parasite replication rate. And again, we have the highest fitness at an intermediate level. And then along this axis, what we do is we increase the medicinal properties of the plants. You can see this curve shifting to the right. So shifting to parasites with higher parasite replication rates, which correlate with higher fitness. 
right? So this sort of medication that we see that is not perfect because it reduces parasite infection, it doesn't prevent it, could actually select for more virulent parasites. So we're using the Monarch system right now to actually test this hypothesis really as a model for this bigger question of whether imperfect treatments such as imperfect vaccines can increase for parasite, uh, parasite virulence. And the way we do that is going to those populations that I showed you before, collect parasites from those different populations and compare the virulence in the lab, predicting that in the populations where the monarchs use more medicinal milkweed, we're going to find parasites with higher fit, uh, virulence. The other thing that we're doing is finding out what sort of medication the monarchs actually evolve based on the prevalence of parasites in the natural environment. So this is a map. And every location where there is a pie chart, the pie chart shows in gray the, the proportion of monarchs that are not infected with this parasite, and in black, the proportion of monarchs that are infected with the parasite. And what you can see, there's a lot of variation. So here in eastern North America, where the monarchs migrate to Mexico, we can see that about 15% of the monarchs are infected. But when you go to South Florida, then this is actually a conservative estimate because it's, it's more like 80 to 100% of the monarchs are infected. So you see very, very big differences. And so the question that we are addressing now is how does this sort of parasite risk affect the evolution of medical behaviors, medicinal behaviors in the monarchs? And together with another Frenchman, also in Montpellier, they have very good theoretical ecologist in Montpellier. And I think part of the reason is that they don't have much lab space, so all the theoreticians like being there, because they only need an office. And so this was actually a very verbal model that we made into a real theoretical model. The prediction was that you get plastic medication, and with that, what I mean is that you use medicine only when you need it. So you only need use it when you're infected. That's when you use it. Versus genetically fixed medication, that would be that the monarchs always use medicinal plants. Regardless of whether they're infected, they always use it. So one way to think about it, this is sort of therapeutic medicine, you use it when you're sick, versus prophylactic medicine, you always use it just in case you do get sick. And so in this we made a theoretical model. It's in principle very easy. We have four different genotypes. We have a genotype random that uses toxic and non-toxic milkweeds. Toxic here means medicinal, non-toxic means non-medicinal. And the monarchs use it at random, so in the proportion that the plants actually occur in nature. Then we have monarchs that prefer the toxic plants, regardless of infection. The monarchs that prefer the non-toxic plants, or the plastic monarchs that prefer the toxic plants when infected with the parasite, but the non-toxic plants when uninfected. And the only thing that differs between these butterflies, these genotypes, is the costs and benefits that they suffer. Now, the benefits from using toxic plants is the same for all of them. When they are infected, they will have a benefit because the plants reduce the success of the parasites and increase the fitness of the monarchs. What is different is the costs. So we have costs that the monarchs um, experience are parasite virulence as well as toxicity to the monarch. And that is true for genotype R. Those are the only costs it, it bears, right? So when it's infected, it suffers virulence. When it uses a toxic plant, it suffers from the toxic effects of the plant. Now, the two genotypes that have a preference also have a preference cost. And what is a preference cost? It means if you prefer one plant over another and you find the other plant, you basically forego an opportunity to lay eggs. So that's a cost. You spend time finding the right plants. So that can be incorporated in this preference cost. And that's the same for that other genotype. And finally, we have the genotype P, the plastic genotype. And that is yet another cost, that is plasticity cost. So these monarchs need the ability to be able to change their choices based on what they experience. And we assume there is some cost involved in that. And then what we can do is basically look at this two-dimensional parameter space based on parasite virulence on the x-axis, plant toxicity on the y-axis, and find out which of the genotypes are favored, selected for, under these different conditions. If there is no parasites, which is kind of a boring situation, of course, we find that there is only two genotypes that get selected, the random one below this level of plant toxicity, and the monarchs that always prefer the non-toxic plants above this threshold level of plant toxicity. 
And that threshold is really determined by the fact that at that point, the cost of avoiding the toxic plant, so the cost of having the preference, outweighs you know, the cost of the plant toxicity. So this is when you get the monarchs selecting non-toxic plants. Now we add the parasites. This is, of course, much more interesting. Now we have this area here. At high parasite prevalence and high plant toxicity, we get selection for plastic monarchs. And that means with the point again is these monarchs have to pay an extra cost, which is a plasticity cost, and it's only worth paying when virulence is high, so avoiding the cost of virulence is worth it, and avoiding the cost of plant toxicity, or, or taking benefit of the plant toxicity is, is worth it. <coughs> when everyone is infected, you see the plastic genotype has disappeared, right? Because at that point, everyone is going to be infected. There's no point paying the cost for plasticity, you should and really, for most of the parameter space, always choose the toxic plants. And you can show this in a movie as well. I'll show this briefly. And so what this is showing basically on, the, on this bar here, we increase parasite prevalence from zero to one. And I'm gonna pulse it in a second to show you something interesting. So you see the plastic area grows, and now it starts shrinking. And there it's gone. Oops. Press the wrong button. You get to see it again. So basically, <clears throat> the plastic genotype already disappears at 90%. Take my word for it. Somewhere, when that reached there, it was gone. Right? And so that means that even when not everyone is infected, there is a level of parasite prevalence in a population where the monarchs should no longer be plastic, they should just all start using the toxic milkweed because the chance of being affected is so high that it's not worth ever avoiding the toxic plants. That's basically what the model comes down to. Now the nice thing is that we can actually test these predictions. We can test them by using monarchs from different populations. So here we have parasite prevalence over time in South Florida, in Australia, and in Eastern and Western North America. And you see really consistent patterns over time. Some populations have very high prevalence and some have low prevalence. So our hypothesis based on this is that we're going to see plastic medication in these populations where parasite prevalence is low. It's worth paying the cost of plasticity because the parasite risk is low and avoiding toxic plants where you don't need them is worth it. But in South Florida, where most monarchs are infected, you should find monarchs always preferring the toxic plants because there's just no point avoiding them. Now, what we have shown you before, these are the data I showed you before, that was a form of plastic medication, right? Only the infected monarchs had a preference for the medicinal plant, the uninfected monarchs did not. So let's have a look at Eastern North America, where there's also low parasite prevalence. Here, what we did is we reared monarchs, again, just like before, on tuberosa plants and gave them over the position choice between curacao the medicinal and the non-medicinal plant here. And we see the same pattern, right? Infected monarchs strongly preferring the medicinal plant, uninfected monarchs having no preference, another form of plastic medication. But then we go to South Florida, where parasite prevalence is really high. What we do, we rear the monarchs here on Asclepius incarnata, gave them a choice between physocarp and tuberosa. You can see these plants have changed. Why have we done that? for the reason that the monarchs in South Florida use Asclepius curosafica a lot, and we don't want them to just choose that plant because they know them. So we you know, give them three different plants they don't know from their natural environment and see how they respond to them. And what we see here is that infected and uninfected monarchs have a preference to lay their eggs on the medicinal plant in this comparison. Right? And this is actually a beautiful outlier that tells you that these data must be real, because no one would ever made up a stupid point like that. Right? So there is variation, but by and large there is a strong preference for the monarchs to prefer the medicinal plant. We've repeated that with, with, with other species of plants, you can see the same. This is again Eastern North America, infected monarchs preferring the plants, uninfected not. And South Florida, again, infected and uninfected monarchs preferring the medicinal milkweed. So, so far, this is really supporting the hypothesis and, and in line with the predictions from our model that when parasite prevalence is high enough, you're basically going to have the monarchs preferring the medicinal milkweed. And what we want to do now is go to more populations and really see if this is a general finding. Of course, we just have a few comparisons here. We want to make this much broader. All right, I'm going to skip this last part because this would run over time. So you can just 
see in all by the beautiful colors. Mm -hmm. Oh, very cool. But Natasha has already seen this, so that's good. All right, so I focused on, uh, this should say, three questions now. I looked at the evolution of parasite virulence and really found that, based on our data, what this tells us is that virulence can evolve as a byproduct of selection on parasite transmission. It was really showing what theory had shown for a long time, but really showing it in a real system. And then from there, we saw that the milkweeds are very important. So milkweeds can really reduce parasite infection and disease. And monarch can use milkweeds as a medication, not as self-medication as such, but more like offspring, transgenerational medication. And then what I've shown you that, at least in theory, this medication may select for higher virulence. This is actually relevant to a lot of other situations, such as the vaccine development going on right now. And I've also shown you that high parasite risk can be expected to select for genetically fixed medication, which is what we're following up right now. I didn't show you all this cool stuff. With that, I want to thank all the people in my life that have, over the years, really contributed. This is, of course, a lot of people that were involved in that. And it just gives us some more minutes if you have any questions about this work.